Welcome to the random stuff video for December. This one's a little bit different because it has a common theme and for that reason I'm going to start with the comment positivity section. So reading glasses on. This is where we're just going to pick out a bunch of comments that were either positive or encouraging or asked interesting questions or deserve an answer. So um, just to start off with, on the Quantux Head video, which came out last week, uh, a lot of people pointed out that the ruined building I saw was a lime kiln, an old lime kiln. This is where limestone would be burned to make quicklime for making cement or for other purposes. I think quicklime has agricultural uses as well, and I think they used to actually use it when they were burying diseased animals and things like that. They used to put quicklime over them to, in theory, hasten decomposition or disinfect them or something like that. Anyway, that ruined building at the top of the cliff there at Quantux Head is apparently a, an old lime kiln. So the big news, obviously we've moved house. I revealed that in the Fuchsiaberry video that I published last week. Thank you for everyone who congratulated us on the move. Uh, we've now kind of settled in. We've got probably two thirds of the boxes unpacked and uh, we're gradually finding our feet here in the new house. Thank you very much to everyone who congratulated us for it and wished us well. Thank you. A few people asked why we moved house and good question. Uh, short answer, we wanted to. The old house where I used to live had been on the market since February uh, and I couldn't really talk about it in videos because the trouble is when you put your house on the market you have to have photos of your house. So I couldn't reveal that we were moving house unfortunately because revealing that we were moving house would have enabled those small proportion of weird stalkers out there to match up pictures of the house in the sale listing with things that they can see in videos that I record inside my own house and find out where we live and I don't really want that to happen. For the same reason I'm not going to reveal the precise location of our new house. We've moved to Dorset, that's probably all I'm going to say about that. The It's a shame in a way because the new house that we've moved to, it's not a new house, it's an old house, has got a lot of very very interesting features and has got some history to it which would be fascinating to do in a video but unfortunately I can't share those details because it would kind of pinpoint my location and dox me. One of the things people said, one can only assume Atomic Shrimp had to move house because the three-cornered leaks finally took over the old Shrimp HQ. <laughs> Tiny little bit of truth there. Um, no, it, it, the, the three-cornered leaks were a massive nuisance and we couldn't get rid of them, but that wasn't really the reason for moving. We just fancied a change of location, a change of pace of life, a change of scenery, and a new launch point for exploring stuff. And that actually brings us on to the next question, which was somebody asked, are we still going to see you going for walks and foraging in the New Forest, or are you too far away from that now? Well, Dorset's just the other side of the New Forest, so I will still be visiting the New Forest. There are other places to visit here in Dorset, so it's going to be some of the old and some of the new. And I still have reasons to go back to the place where I used to live anyway, so we might still do one or two things in the kind of Southampton area. Next comment, my sigh of relief when I saw we were keeping the triangle pattern tablecloth in the new house. Yep, so we've still got the atomic shrimp tablecloth for better or worse. I know some people love that, other people hate it. There it is, it's very distinctive. It's a part of my channel branding almost, and it's not going away. I don't know what I'm gonna do when that tablecloth wears out because I don't think that fabric is available anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Moves to a new house, immediately starts eating ornamental plants, because of course he does. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> One of the first things I did when we got here was have a look around the garden, figure out what edibles we've got and what potential we've got for a little bit of snacking out there in the garden. We will have a look at the garden a bit later in this video. And finally, on the Fuchsia Berry videos, a couple of people commented to say that there is a variety called Berry, or a cultivar called Berry, which is specifically bred for the flavor of the fuchsia berries. So I will be seeking that out and definitely acquiring a specimen of that. And we'll plant it in the garden here at Shrimp Cottage. And hopefully we'll have another fuchsia berry video at some point in the future where we taste some fuchsia berries, which apparently have got a cherry kiwi flavor. That sounds really nice and let's give it a try. Anyway, on with the rest of the video now. And most of this video is going to be either about the process of moving or some of the features and perhaps some of the challenges of the new shrimp cottage. We're moving out of this house in a day or two. And so we are down to the last few bits and pieces in 
this little familiar atomic shrimp kitchen let me show you what i mean by that so like the ingredients cupboard is almost bare the herb and spice cupboard is empty mixing bowls no mixing bowls now we got <laughs> one pan one pot plenty of coffee very few baking trays and tins there's nothing in quite a few of the drawers we've got and we're down to two sharp knives i think and a can opener obviously got to have a can opener and a few utensils and cutlery we really are kind of bare bones at this point the only herbs and spices i've got is my little traveling spice kit so i thought what we might do i'm gonna to have to improvise now because i'm running out of ingredients a lot of things are packed i'm gonna make uh, something out of whatever we've got so it's gonna be something in the vicinity of pizza because i've got these flour tortilla wraps left to use i think there are four in there uh, I've got, I haven't got any, I haven't got any kind of pizza topping tomato sauce, but I've got ketchup, I've got tomatoes, I think we've got some tomato puree. I've got some gochujang, I thought that might be quite interesting to try. Got cheese, got some cheap sausages, and some rather posh sounding, but actually quite cheap salami from Lidl. Let's try and put this together. Jenny's not a fan of salami, so she's going to have the sausages. I had to unpack a box to get the olive oil. And these sausages, they're very cheap little sausages. I'm just going to break them up into kind of almost like little meatballs. So the sauce for my kind of not exactly pizza is going to just have these tomatoes in it. So I've got some fresh tomatoes here, which I'll chop up fairly small. I'm not going to bother trying to peel them. That'll do. Squirt tomato puree in there. Also a squirt of ketchup. Little glug of oil. Let's just see what that looks like when it's mixed up. I think that'll more or less spread okay. I do have herbs, just a small amount of mixed dried herbs from my spice kit. Oh, and I do have paprika as well, so I, we might as well put a little bit of red paprika in there as well. A tiny splash of water, I think. Now, I haven't put the gochujang in there because Jenny doesn't like spicy as much as I do. So I'll put that after I've spread hers. The topping on mine is going to be this oddly shaped salami. That's about right. Now a wheat tortilla wrap like this might be fine for a kind of thin and crispy pizza, pizza type of thing. But I thought it might be fun to spread a little bit of grated cheese down. Put another one of those on and then build my pizza on top of this. So it's kind of like a quesadilla, but also like a pizza. About half of this red sauce. More cheese, because why not? And then these little cooked nuggets of sausage. A little bit more cheese, why not? Okay, that's one. And then mine is very much the same, except I've got a tiny bit of gochujang left, which I will scrape out and use up. And mix that into my topping sauce, which will make it a little bit spicy. I think it's gonna be nice. Now, pizza purists, in case you're screaming at me for breaking pizza and whatever the origin of pizza is basically what have we got to put on bread we'll put anything we've got on bread so in fact what i'm doing here using up whatever we've got leftovers in the fridge bits and pieces that we've got in the cupboards is perhaps more authentic pizza than authentic pizza i am just throwing together what we've got rather than following a recipe and the origin of pizza is pretty much exactly that. A little bit more cheese over the top, just to go crispy. Right, those are gonna go in the oven at 180 degrees Celsius for probably only about 10 or 15 minutes. And we'll see what happens when they come out. Okay, that appears to have kind of worked. They're gonna be quite floppy because it is only thin flour tortillas. 
but yeah that's kind of worked so just hack those up into wedges and it's a combination of very crispy on the edge and kind of gooey in the middle heterogeneity I believe is the term so that's Jenny's well even though this is dangerously hot I am going to have a little taste just so I can tell you what that gochujang is like as a sauce that works really well on a pizza it just adds a lot of depth and robust flavour that works gochujang in a pizza topping sauce trust me works really well right day the next of using up odds and ends as we are moving out so I've got here just some bits of pasta ends of packets I've got one chicken breast some vegetables a bit of cheese a bit of cooked bacon going to put that together into something a bit like macaroni cheese but with vegetables and stuff in it so here we go chicken breast fillet I've just sliced in half and I'm just going to put some paprika on there and a tiny sprinkle of salt then I've got some mucky fat which was left over from frying I think beef mince earlier in the week so we'll get that in the pan I'll use it all actually because if there's any left over we can use it for making the roux get that nice and hot and we'll get the chicken breast in there meanwhile gonna have to cook the pasta in the one pan I haven't got packed away we haven't got a whole lot of pasta so I'm gonna cut up this potato into pieces that will cook in about the same time as pasta does so probably like that sort of shape and size I guess that's probably about the size you'd cut for chips and that can go in the water together with the pasta in fact I'll put that in first so potato can go straight in there now and when that comes up to the boil I'll get the pasta in as well chicken's doing nicely the other vegetables so the parsnip and carrot I'm not going to parboil these so I'll just cut them nice and thin on the mandolin section of my grater which is not all that easy with the parsnip because it's a little bit fibrous but we'll do the best we can I probably could have done that quicker with a knife and just slice them nice and thin carrot on the other hand should be fine potatoes boiling away now so that's about enough so I've still got a little bit left for something else tomorrow so pasta's now in with the potatoes that's probably going to more or less completely fill up that pan. We'll have a couple of sticks of celery in there as well. And I will not attempt to mandolin these. But I'm just going to cut them the size that they will cook through at the same time as the carrots. Spring onions. We'll lose the roots. I'll kind of cut the white parts nice and fine. Up to about there. I'll save those leafy bits for garnish. Chicken is done now, so that'll come out to rest for a moment. And now in this remaining fat and fond, all of those vegetables, and I'll just kind of stir fry those until they're starting to go tender. Right, pasta and potatoes. Pasta's not quite done, but there is a method in my madness. I'm going to drain it now because we're going to make a fairly thin cheese sauce and then bake it in the oven and it will continue to hydrate this pasta. Before we wash up this pan, I'm going to make the cheese sauce in there. Last little scrap of butter, not quite enough. I'll supplement it with a little glug of olive oil. Right, uh, you want to make a roux, but I don't have the right flour. All I've got is wholemeal bread flour, so I guess we'll just have to see what happens with this. All of the other flour is either packed away or used up. A wholemeal roux. I've never done this before, so I don't know what, what's going to happen here. But I imagine it's going to thicken up, okay. So we'll just fry that for a little while, just to take the raw flour edge off of it. Normally I would use a whisk to keep this moving, but I don't have one of those 
unpacked. So a bit of cold milk. And we just heat it until it takes up that flour. Yeah, <laughs> it's not gonna be a very smooth sauce for sure. Okay, starting to thicken, so it is working. But it's, it's gonna be like, a bit like, um, it's gonna be a bit like a porridge almost, isn't it? A bit more milk. And we'll just keep on doing that until it won't take any more milk without going thin. So I've got about, there must be about three quarters of a pint of milk here. I think I'm probably gonna use nearly all of that. Bearing in mind, I want this sauce to be a little bit on the thin side because it has to hydrate the pasta. Okay, I'm gonna turn that down now, let that just bubble away and thicken a bit more. Cheese, I've got maybe 100 grams of cheese here. Just gonna cut that up into small cubes. Someone heard cheese being unwrapped. All right. So cheese is in there now, and it's not necessary to grate cheese in a sauce like this because it will just melt in and dissolve. It is gonna be an interestingly wheaty sort of porridgey cheese sauce, but I don't really see why that needs to be a problem. I didn't think we had any mustard left, but we have got a bit of English mustard, so I'll just put about half a teaspoonful in there. I've got to be careful not to burn this. And mustard just helps to enhance the cheese flavor. Taste for seasoning. Plenty salty enough because that's mature cheddar and it's quite a salty cheese. And that's enough mustard, I think. I think it could stand some mixed dried herbs in there. Just a little pinch. All right, so that's the sauce. So those vegetables were stir fried. Into that, my pasta and potatoes. Right, back on the heat. And I'm just gonna cook the, this the rest of the way in the pan. I was gonna put it in the oven and bake it, but <laughs> the oven's being cleaned at the moment. So I might be able to use the grill, but we can't use the oven. So that's got the sauce in there. I think we do need a little bit more milk just to loosen that up because the pasta still has to take up a little bit more moisture. All right, lid on. I'm just gonna let that simmer for about five minutes. And while that's happening, I'll cut up the chicken. Nice tender chicken pieces, which we'll put on top. It's a couple of minutes of simmering and that pasta has just absorbed some of that cheese sauce and the consistency is now still nice and gloopy but it's firmed up a little bit. Now just need to turn the heat down. Just scatter that chicken on top. We'll have a little bit more cheese just grated on top of that and then the bacon and then we're just going to throw this under the grill for probably just a couple of minutes just to crisp up that bacon and melt the cheese. Improvised dinner number two and we've still got some little bits and pieces in the fridge so tomorrow we'll do another improvised thing. Okay right I'm just going to taste a little bit of this before we start and then I can turn the camera off while we enjoy our dinner. But there we go. So the sauce has thickened up nicely and absorbed into that pasta and stuff. Let's give it a little taste. Very hot. It's good and actually that sauce hasn't suffered very much from being made with wholemeal flour. It is a little bit grainy but not in a bad way. So there we go, improvised dinner number two. My little studio, all but packed down now. Sounds very echoey in here. If you've noticed a bit echoey sound in some of the recordings I've made lately, that'll be why. But yep, nearly everything is gone from here now. Laser cutter is gone. The Altair 8800 is gone. All of my craft bits and pieces and miscellaneous stuff, all packed up. Just the computer and desk, which I've got one or two more videos to edit before we move. Right, part three of cooking with whatever we've got left in the house before we move out. This is actually probably the last meal I'm gonna cook in this house. So we've got some bits and pieces of chicken portion that I found in the freezer. We've got a variety of vegetables, a tiny little remnant of a bag of lentils, 
a few bits of pasta, different kinds of pasta. Just gonna make a chicken stew, I think. So the first thing to do is get this chicken on and frying. Good bit of oil in the pan. And these chicken portions, I'm not even really sure what they are. Some of them, are, some of them look like kind of drum ends from wings. Really quite weird and scrawny little pieces of chicken, but it'll do. And while that starts to fry, I'm gonna chop up the vegetables that will go in with it. Vegetables that are gonna go in the pan with the chicken include this shallot. Now these vegetables that are gonna go in with the chicken like this, these are the ones I want to take a little bit of browning. So I want to fry them as well as stew them in a moment. Parsnips are better roasted, but the oven's been cleaned and decommissioned now, so we're not roasting any more anythings, or baking if you like. So I'm gonna slice up this parsnip into chunks so that the pieces will cook and get a bit of browning on them. Celery also is good. I mean, we're essentially doing a bit like a mirepoix or a, um, one of those sofrito type of things, but the celery will benefit from having a little bit of a fry with the chicken and getting some color on it. And I'm gonna save the core of the celery. These little leaves we'll put in right at the end as a bit of kind of garnish and color. We'll have like maybe four of these small red peppers. I think, well, the bag says they're seedless. Let's see if that's actually true. Well, it is, how about that? Yeah, it's browning a little bit. I'll give it a bit more than that. Okay, that's had a chance to brown. So the vegetables are gonna join the chicken in the pan. And then from my little traveling spice kit, which is the only herbs and spices I've got that aren't packed, we've got one of these little seasoning cubes. So that can go in there now. And this will provide not only some of the salt this recipe needs, but an extra little boost of savory flavor. While those vegetables are frying, I will just prepare the other bits that are gonna go in there. These carrots, the skin's nothing special, so I'm gonna peel them. This stew's gonna be cooked a fair old time, so I will cut my carrots into thick slices. Also, swede. Let's cut that bit off there, it's dried up a bit. Or if, you, if you're in America, you know this is rutabaga probably. If you're in Scotland, you'll know this is neep. Now ordinarily I would save all of these pieces for the stock pot, but the freezer is already defrosted. So these are just gonna go on the compost heap. And the next resident of this house can enjoy the benefit of that. And again, I'm gonna go for chunky dice. About like that. Just the sort of size that I feel like will cook through in the time available. Meanwhile, over here, you can see the chicken is still browning a little bit, and these vegetables are starting to take a little bit of color on the corners and edges. I'll give them a little bit longer. Big old squirt of tomato puree in there. And I'll just let that cook for a bit. Mixed dried herbs, because that's what we got. I had forgotten all about the garlic, lurking at the back of the counter there. So we'll have a couple of cloves of garlic. While there's still time to give those a little fry before we start adding the wet ingredients. Timing is kind of accidentally perfect. Now the carrot and sweet. A couple pieces evaded me and then some sweet paprika. Which I've got to be careful because this burns really easily. Just going to give that 30 seconds of frying. I'm not sure if the camera was rolling for the last bit, so just when that tomato puree and garlic came up to being cooked, I added about a couple of teaspoons full of sweet paprika and then fried that for just 30 seconds and then added a pint of water. Now I'm just bringing that back up to a simmer and then I've got about a quarter of a cup of red split lentils which I've sifted through. I'm not going to wash them because it makes them impossible to handle. I've sifted through to make sure that that thing people get concerned about which is rocks is not an issue. 
I'm going to turn that down, put the lid on, and let that simmer for half an hour. In readiness for the end of cooking, so that I can, mainly so that I can clear away some of the prep. This is the core of the celery bunch, which I'll just chop up the leafy bits. Chef's privilege. Much nice. And I've got a bunch of spring onions here. I'll trim off the wonky looking ends. And I only really want the green part here, so I think the other part's going to go in the compost. Unless I can think of a thing to do with that. Maybe I'll have a spring onion omelette for breakfast tomorrow. Okay, so that's going to stand by, ready to go in at the last minute. We are about halfway through simmering, and I'm just going to peel this potato. The skin's not great, so I'm going to peel a potato, dice that, and throw that in as well. It won't take as long to cook as the other things in the pan, but by the time I've got this done, the other vegetables are halfway there. Potatoes in. I've just given it a little bit more water. Again, the camera wasn't rolling. I don't know what I'm doing. A lot of other things on my mind, clearly. So potatoes are in, a little bit more water, and that still needs about another probably 20 minutes of simmering. We're probably about three quarters of the way through cooking now. Everything in here is actually cooked, so now it's kind of safe to taste for seasoning. It does need a bit more salt, but I think rather than just use salt, I'm gonna use a little piece of one of these stock cubes, which are quite salty, but also taste of chicken. So I think it's probably only be about a quarter of one of these stock cubes. Like a piece like that. The rest will go back in my spice kit because when we land at the other end of this move, we're also going to be in a bit of a makeshift situation regarding cooking. So there might be a few weirdly makeshift meals at the new house. Right, we're about two minutes away from the end of cooking. And I'm just going to throw in a handful of this stuff. This is a Polish pasta for soups. Macaron Lubelski, I believe it's called. Although I might be pronouncing that wrong. I was hoping to use up the pasta, but there isn't room in this dish for it anyway. We've already got potatoes in here, and we're going to have bread with it too. So I don't really want to kind of max out too much on the starch. I may already have done that. We're at the end of cooking. Let's have a look. Potatoes are completely tender, chicken is falling off the bone, carrots again completely tender, so I'm just going to turn that off and let that sit for 10 minutes. It'll be way too hot to enjoy at this stage, so I'm just going to let that sit for 10 minutes, cool down a little bit and then all those flavours will just come together. I almost forgot the spring onions and celery leaves, which I'll just put in at this stage now and they'll stay nice and green. Okay well there it is and actually for a dish I think for a dish made with just what we had in the house I actually think that looks rather nice. So yeah bread is just coming I'm just going to dish up a portion of this and we'll see what it tastes like. I'm not going to do a full taste test at the table because we've got things to do and I would rather relax when we're eating so anyway give this a little taste. Mm, that's really nice actually, really comforting, probably does still need a little bit, of, still lacking a little bit of seasoning, but of course we can add that at the table. Chicken, as I say, completely tender, falling off the bone. Really nice, hearty winter dish. Well, I said that was going to be the last meal I cooked in this kitchen, but actually it's breakfast on the day before removals and things are really really kind of sparse in here now just to let just to show you so that's the fridge and we're de defrosting it now so the bottle of milk last bottle of milk is going to go in this little mini fridge there's almost nothing here now all of the drawers are empty oh, there's some, oh that's bits of stuff we're leaving um so anyway, I'm going to try and cook myself an omelette. I've got a few vegetables left. I've got some cheese, a bit of salami. We've got eggs. So I'm going to try and assemble an omelette, but we've got no chopping boards or and the cutlery we've got is camping cutlery. So I'll do the best I can.
Oh, and weird camera angles are because my tripods are packed away. So, kitchen scissors. Got these spring onions, they can just get snipped into the pan. Red peppers. Fortunately, these are seedless. Didn't buy them because they're seedless, that just happened to be the way they came. But it was a selling point. But that does make them rather more convenient for using in this manner. Not that I would recommend this manner. Uh, these little onions, little shallots, these I will just have to cut in hand using my pocket knife. Just cut those into little chunks. So I'm going to get that on to fry and as it's cooking I'm going to slice some thin pieces of potato in. I'm not going to use the whole of that potato. But I will use as much as I can and I'm going to cut it as thin as I can. Potato peeler and chopping boards and grater and mandolin and all that kind of thing all packed away. So I've just got to improvise a little bit. So I'll just shave off pieces of this potato. Straight into the pan. And that way we don't end up cutting onto a hard surface which would blunt the knife or cutting onto the work surface which would damage the work surface. What we are accidentally making here is not very far away from a Spanish tortilla. Okay. Eggs. We've got a few eggs left. And a little bit of salt in there just to loosen them up as I beat these eggs. That will help to loosen up the mixture. And I'm going to have some herbs in this one as well. Might as well whisk them into the eggs. Dried mixed herbs. And I'm going to let that sit a little bit for the salt to work on the proteins and it'll loosen this up and it will pour better into the pan. Potatoes here are nearly done. What I'm actually going to do is put a little bit of water in there. And by the time that water has evaporated and we're back to frying, it'll be time to put the eggs in. Meanwhile, I do still have some of this. This is this wild boar salami. So I'll cut a few slices of that because that can go on top. Also, cheese. So we're back to frying over here now. And the potatoes, you can see the potatoes have gone a little bit soft, kind of a little bit floppy. Make sure the potatoes are not stuck on the bottom of the pan and then distribute them a little bit. And then go the eggs. Now I'm going to turn the heat down because I want that to cook really nice and gently. But also, I want the cheese to kind of melt into it. Grating would have been ideal, but the grate has packed away. And I think actually we might as well have this salami warmed through as well. Okay, right, heat down, because I'm just going to let that cook reasonably gently, and then we'll see what it looks like when it's done. Okay, just a little bit of finishing under the grill. And I am going to have to cut this to get it out of the pan. Not the tidiest presentation, but not bad looking for a breakfast. Now, I do have pepper. The pepper mill is still is packed away, but I still have some pepper that I ground 
into my little spice kit. So we'll have some black pepper on there. And then let's get that to the table and give it a taste. So tender potatoes, salami, cheese, red peppers, onions, egg, what's not to like. So that is gonna be the last meal cooked in that kitchen. The next meal you see me cooking in some other video will be in the new house. So this is the end of the this era of Atomic Shrimp HQ. Everything is packed up and the removal guys are here taking it away. The, the kitchen, uh, this is now the remaining provisions, some bread and some things to put on there and this little fridge because the big fridge is, well the re regular size fridge is going on the van. So we've got a pint of milk in there, some cheese and a bit of margarine and a few little bits left over here to tide us over. So I guess this is goodbye to Atomic Shrimp Kitchen or at least this Atomic Shrimp Kitchen and we will shortly be saying hello to a new Atomic Shrimp Kitchen. Okay so actually this is the last meal we're cooking in this house. Lunch on the day before the move. Everything is gone from the house so we're just gonna have ramen and Jenny's gonna have some tuna. We packed the decent can opener so I had to use this thing to wrench open a tin of tuna. For once I wished for a pull tab can, how ironic. I'm gonna have some eels with my noodles. So we have landed in the new house. Boxes everywhere. Cozy doggo. Boxes everywhere. And the first meal in the kitchen, the new kitchen, the new Atomic Shrimp HQ kitchen, very compact kitchen, is going to be a can of soup. Not even weird stuff in a can, though. The YouTube algorithm might have something to say about cocker leaky soup. We've just about found enough cutlery and the saucepan to be able to cook that. So first meal in the new house, two tins of soup and some bread. In the old house, all of the kitchen and dining room accommodation was on the first floor. And so to get to the garden, I had to go downstairs around the corner and we didn't really make much use of the garden as a result of that. So. One of the reasons we chose this house is you can step straight out of the kitchen into the garden. So we can grow some herbs along here. And so if I want fresh herbs, I'll just be able to step into the downstairs garden here and go and get them. Why am I calling it the downstairs garden? Well, the garden is terraced. And so when we go upstairs, we're still in the garden, which I really like. So we've got an upstairs garden and a downstairs garden. My studio, which I'm still busy unpacking, has got room for a table that I can work on and make videos and weird stuff in a can and so on, on, and a separate computer desk, which I found this in a second hand shop. It's a very weird desk, but it actually fits the space really nicely because it tapers at one end. And so it goes against the wall there and it gives me freedom to access this windowsill here and when I sit here by the desk I've got a lovely view of the garden through the window but yeah a little bit of work to do still to get this studio unpacked and in some semblance of order so the new garden at the new atomic shrimp HQ has lots and lots of walls and loads and loads of hearts tongue ferns actually growing on the walls one thing is interestingly absent from here is wall pennywort which I did expect to find here but we haven't got and wall pennywort is an edible native plant so I will probably try to get some of it established on these walls we've got a nice wall all the way along here got a sedum or something here we've got another wall here by the downstairs greenhouse strawberries wild strawberries I'll just wait for this farm truck to go past
and another wall here although this is a retaining wall so I probably won't make holes in this to try and grow anything because that's probably a bad idea but again wild strawberries all around here so looking forward to wild strawberries in early summer next year more hearts turn fern there and why did I call that the downstairs greenhouse well because there's also an upstairs greenhouse so amazingly we have two greenhouses I'm planning to grow tomatoes probably in this one tomatoes maybe melons and things next year and I think the other one might be for more ornamental stuff there are some vegetable plots some raised beds which are at the moment full of weeds but the weeds are growing really well which means the soil is hopefully nice and fertile so we've got bittercress here that looks like uh, some something in the daisy family uh, we've got sow thistles there that I think is chickweed might be mouse ear lots of sow thistles grass is getting established there gonna have to go and get some compost I think or some manure and get that on here and let that work its way into the soil during the winter and there is room and scope for a bit more vegetable patch here if we want to not planning to be try to be self-sufficient in any way I think probably what we will do is focus on growing the things that we really enjoy and are very good when you grow them at home like tomatoes when you grow your own tomatoes at home the experience of eating tomatoes is vastly superior oh look that's oxalis there we have a little patch of woodland here which has got lots of elder in it this here is a mature holm oak tree which is the oak, kind of oak tree that has edible acorns that are edible without much processing huge pine tree here it does run alongside a bit of a road this patch of woodland but i think we're going to be able to do some conservation stuff here so there's a big area up there and then it does go quite a long way along here so well way off over there is where it ends but it's quite a narrow strip from there on so that's what we've got there's quite a lot of interesting things here lots of elder as i say this stuff i can't remember what it's called but this is the thing that has white berries the stems of this stuff i believe are quite good for making baskets actually so i might cut some of this back and let it sprout some nice straight stems i believe it's quite good for basketry quite a lot of cyclamen in the wood woods here we may we may remove this because i think what we might be trying to do in this woodland is try to go for more native plants and try and increase the native biodiversity lovely old pile of rotting logs here which i will just leave because this is going to be a fantastic little haven for hedgehogs and and beetles in the rotting logs and all sorts of things so we're just going to leave some of this and let it be a place for nature um i'm not all that sure what we've got in this woodland because we moved in in november and so a lot of things are dormant at this stage there might be bluebells in here for example i don't know we'll, we'll see as the spring comes round and hopefully we'll just find some lovely surprises i have got nettles here so that's good i've also got a shed full of more firewood there's elder here i think oh this is an elm i think yeah i think this is elm elm trees in the uk really only survive as a hedgerow tree now because of dutch elm disease but we seem to have one here several here actually and then behind that there's an elder another elder and i might uh i think i'll probably leave this one because it's going to produce some fruit next year <laughs> more firewood now i did pick really the wrong time of day to go and record this because there are cars coming past on the road um, normally it's a little bit quieter than this one of the things in my new studio is I have to share residents of the studio with the hot water system so in here there is the hot water tank and 
it's lovely and warm so we put some linen and towels and things in there to keep them nice and aired and dry and then above there in behind this panel which just comes off by undoing four turn buttons and pulling a sheet of plywood out there's a header tank for the hot water system which we're just going to have a look at in a moment so the problem with this water tank i've got in my studio is not that it fills obviously that has to happen it's what happens when it's finished filling so this float valve here takes forever to stop and even when it's completely full it drips for probably about an hour and a half until it fully closes so I think probably just the diaphragm or the washer in the float valve could be replaced but the valve itself looks like it's really about time it went on the scrap heap and we replaced that with a brand new one yeah so it's full now the tank is full now but it will continue dripping like this for an hour or more. Um, in case you're worried about the appearance of this tank, all this limescale and detritus here, this is only the header tank for the hot water. This is why in the UK it's always been kind of uh, traditional wisdom not to drink from the hot tap because in a conventional old-fashioned heating and hot water system like we've got here the hot water tank is fed from a cold water tank such as this which is open at the top and spiders and birds and rats and things can fall into this which is kind of gross but it is what it is so that's why in the UK you quite often be told you should never drink from the hot tap and that's quite often why in the UK you've got separate hot and cold taps on sinks because the hot water system worked this way. Obviously there are different ways to do that that might be better but changing to that would entail ripping out this system and installing a new one which I'm not going to do. I am however going to replace this float valve or bullcock as some people like to call it. So, can't get a camera up here while I'm working, but this is going to consist of turning off the cold water at the mains. So we'll undo that one, which is the cold feed. We'll undo that one, which is just the nut that holds it to the tank. That valve should then come out in one piece. And then I can take it to the shop and make sure I get one that I'm getting that is exactly the same size. Get one that's a matching fit. Because there's a variety of these different things. Right, so I'm going to have to turn the camera off because I can't get in here with a camera in my face. So, okay, so with both of those nuts undone, that's the one that actually clamps the joint. That's the one that just holds the bull float valve in place. We should find. Yep, the valve just comes out in one piece. So now I've got to take this rusty old thing to the plumbing store see if I can find an exact replacement. Reason being, I just don't want to have to change pipe work. I don't want to change the bore of anything or whatever, because I bet this olive here won't come off. Okay, old part, new part, managed to find an exact replacement. And I haven't bought a new float because this is perfectly serviceable and this is not so easy to recycle as this is. Brass is obviously valuable scrap metal, plastic would just go straight to landfill and I think we'll find that the thread, yeah they don't change the thread standards on these things because that's probably an old Whitworth thread uh, just because it needs to be to keep backward compatibility. So we'll have one of those nuts off of there, the other one done up tight. I'll put a bit of PTFE on that. Right, and I'll wind this clockwise around here because that's the direction the nut will be tightened. Is it called a nut or is it a gland or something like that? Anyway, that's the direction that will be tightened. So I will just wind a bit of PTFE on there. That's made a mess of that. There we go, and then when you when I tighten that up, it won't undo the PTFE tape. So we should find 
I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this, but we should find that will just slot through directly and it mates with the pipe very nicely. I shan't fit the float just yet. I'll do that in a moment when I've got everything else tightened up. All right then, so the new valve is fitted with the old float, new valve. Now, one thing that's quite important here is to make sure that this was in the right orientation, that this arm is actually going up and down vertically and not at a skewed angle, because obviously then it wouldn't, well, it might put uneven forces or something on the valve. So it was just necessary to get that straightened up so that this is going up and down straight. I think we're ready to turn the water back on and see what happens. I think it'll rise to a little slightly higher level than it did before, but it's still not going to hit the overflow. Although you can see from the water line, it clearly has done in the past. So water goes back on and we'll expect some weird noises as the pipes are purged of air. Okay, well, first thing to check is no leaks. Just need to turn that outlet a little bit. Okay, well, we'll see what happens when it gets to its point. Now that water level is settling higher than it did with the old valve. I think maybe somebody had bent the arm down on the old one. Perhaps I'll do that, although I don't really see any need to. I'd say the fill level is a little bit on, on the high side. It probably isn't meant to come up onto that little shelf there. Let's just make sure that is going to turn off. Yeah, so it's let's just let it fill a little bit more. Right, and that should now shut off and hopefully won't drip forever. If it does continue to drip, I'll probably just wrap a little bit of wire around there so the drips can run down a wire rather than dripping into the water. But already I can see that that's probably going to be better than it was. But I do think maybe this arm needs to be bent down a little bit. Right, slight adjustment. All I've done here is actually just bent in the end of this arm so the float was not sticking up in the air. Because this valve is mounted into the side of the tank here, which is kind of slightly flared outwards, it means the valve is leaning upwards, which means the arm had to go a long way up before actually triggering. So I bent this piece down in that way, which causes the float to stick down a bit further, and hopefully it will shut off at an earlier stage now. So just gonna go and run some hot water, and we'll see if it works. Okay, let's see where it closes off now. And as I say, if this continues to drip when it's at a very near to closed level, I can always wrap a bit of wire around there and then dangle that down into the water, a bit of stainless steel wire or copper wire or something, and that will just allow the drips something to run down without creating a splash, in theory. But we'll see. It might not be as bad as it was. Of course, this is a, a bit paradoxical. The closer it gets to being full, the lower the flow rate and the more slowly it fills and the more slowly the ball rises and it's almost approaching the point of being closed asymptotically. In the old house this header tank was in the loft but this house doesn't really have much of a loft because as you can see we're in a kind of roof space room. Well hence the angled ceiling here. It does close off with finality. Kind of. And we just need to check there's no leaks here. That's dry, that's good. Right, let's put it all back together. This, by the way, is, ooh, look at that. This is, this is a header tank for the radiators. Same sort of idea, but not water that's gonna come out of taps. This is only gonna flow around the radiator system. And all of that gunge and scum in there is part of the rust and whatever that's in the sludge that's in the radiator system. Probably need to give that a flush out. But that can wait for another day. So that's the kind of introduction to Shrimp Cottage. Uh, it's 
going to be an interesting time because there's lots of little things that need fixing up around the place. I'm not going to pivot this channel into a DIY fix up your house type of channel, but there will be a few more little segments of bits and odd pieces that need fixing as I do them. I'm not an expert on doing any of this, but most of it is figure outable. And so you'll be watching me figuring it out. That water tank, by the way, does need further maintenance. I think I need to remove the lime scale out of there. Most of that is inert lime scale, so it's not really a health problem or anything, but it's pretty unsightly and I think I probably need to clean that out. The reason I didn't do that right then is I need to just formulate a strategy for that. What I need to make sure I don't do is stir up all that lime scale into small pieces and allow it to go into the next part of the system, which is the hot water cylinder. So I'll just need to formulate a strategy for how I'm going to clean that out properly, and we'll do that another time. I probably won't show you that. But yeah, that's an old-fashioned British hot water system with a cold tank header and then a hot water cylinder below. And as I say, that's the reason why in the UK you don't drink from the hot tap, traditionally. On a newer system with a combi boiler that's directly fed from the cold feed and heats the water directly on its way to the tap, not such a problem. But a lot of older houses have got hot water systems that work in this way. And yeah, it's, it's superior to do it other ways different from that. But this is the technology of the time when that was installed. Right, so that's probably enough waffle from me for now. So that was Random Stuff Shrimp Cottage Edition. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.